Our strength comes from our connection with one another, that our relationships are our greatest source of resilience, that they are buffers to stress, and that when we do things together, it's extraordinary how much hardship we can endure. Thank you all so much for being here today on a day when both the possibilities and challenges of democracy and togetherness are playing out with such intensity. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to meet Dr. Murthy on more than one occasion. The first time was when I joined the Gandhi King Conference organizer and physician, Manoj Jain, and we went to go speak with Surgeon General Murthy about the importance of mindfulness to the health and well-being of the nation. And then Dr. Murthy was gracious enough to accept our invitation to be a commencement speaker at UH, where he uh, impressed and inspired our students and community with his leadership, his insights, and his recommendations. Both before and during this pandemic, Dr. Murthy reminded us and reminds us of the importance of focusing on one another, limiting distractions, helping and serving one another, and finding our purpose in the process in order to reclaim meaningful connection and find true help. So this is a great time for us to hear from Dr. Murthy. Welcome, please. Thank so you. let's just uh, jump in. You're returning to um, national health leadership at a perilous moment when the pandemic is still out of control. COVID-19 is obviously no easy adversary. There are so many facets to the crisis. What role should the federal government be playing in all of this? And what do you feel is best left to the states? Also, what is most urgent? Well, it's a great question, Maya, and the circumstances under which I uh, may start my, my tenure as Surgeon General this time are quite different from when I was Surgeon General last time. We were facing an opioid crisis last time. We were struggling with another pandemic, uh, with another in outbreak, I should say, which was Ebola at the time, and soon Zika, the Zika virus would follow. But COVID-19 has affected us like no other uh, outbreak and pandemic in our lifetime. And it uh, has been just profound in terms of the extent uh, of impact, not just on our physical health, but really on our mental health and well being, as well as, of course, on our economic uh, well being. So there are a great deal of challenges. And, and, you know, while it's hard to sort of pick just one or two priorities, I can tell you a couple of things that will be critical for us to address up front. One will be the deployment uh, of a vaccine quickly and fairly. Uh, you know, we've already seen that. Uh, that's not an easy process, getting a uh, vaccine out to millions of people. In fact, it will be the most ambitious vaccination campaign that we attempt in the history of the United States. But it's got to be done quickly, and, and that is going to be certainly top of mind for us. I think the second thing that's going to be a high priority is making sure that, that we address um, a lot of the concern and misinformation also that's out there uh, about COVID, and that we address that in part with clear guidance and with regular communication. And you know, we want businesses and schools to be able to know what steps need to be taken to be able to open uh, safely. We want communities to know what they need to do uh, as well to get their neighborhoods back, uh, back up and running. And we, we want families to be able to know how it is that they can see each other, how they can spend time with, with friends, how we can be with the people we care about, uh, but do so in a way that will, uh, will not put us at increased risk uh, of, sp of spreading or uh, or, or acquiring COVID-19. So those are some areas that you'll see, I think, as, as critical priorities. Um, and the, in terms of federal versus state, this really has to be a really tight partnership uh, between the states uh, and, and the federal government. And by partnership, I mean not a one-way street, but really a two-way street. There is a lot that states are doing on their own right now, which the federal government can not only learn from, but can help uh, share uh, with other states. And there are also capabilities that the federal government obviously has in terms of procure procurement of vaccine, getting that vaccine out to states expeditiously and in a predictable way, making sure that guidance you know, around uh, prevention, around how to use the vaccine and, and, and distribute it uh, to the population in terms of priority levels, that that is explained clearly. Uh, and these are things and places where the federal government can play 
an incredibly important role, as well as, of course, resources. Uh, this is, you know, there are times where we are 50 states and there are times when we're one nation. And this is one of those times where we have to stand together as one, one country, where we have to pull together the resources that we need. And we've got to get them to people who are either struggling with loss of jobs, loss of home, uh, with mounting healthcare bills, uh, because right now we've got to stick together. That's how we get through this pandemic. One of the many tragedies associated with the pandemic has been an exacerbation of healthcare disparities. It's been so clear. Um, can you speak a little bit about what needs to be done exactly to foster more equal healthcare access so that we're better prepared next time, but also so that our communities are more just and uh, so that um, uh, everyone feels um, equally cared for during this time? So it's, it's such a, uh, one of the things that I love about you, Maya, is not just the questions you asked, but I think the frame for those questions, because the way you framed it is very important. You, you framed it, I think, intuitively, not just as a policy challenge, but really as a values challenge. And, and that's what COVID-19 has really done, is it's not only affected people directly in terms of making them ill, and in many cases, we've lost people uh, because of the virus, but it's also unearthed and pulled the curtain back on some profound challenges that we had even before the pandemic arrived, our struggles with addiction, our challenges with mental health, and the profound difficulties we have still with creating an equitable society where people have access to healthcare, where outcomes in health are not determined by where we happen to live or how much money we make. And so we have a challenge now, uh, a challenge to ask ourselves what values really matter to us, and are we willing to do what it takes to live up to those values? If we truly believe that we are a country where every life really does matter, uh, where everyone deserves a, a good shot at a healthy life, then we've got to build a system that actually delivers on that promise. And what that means is a system where people do in fact have access to health insurance coverage. It means a system where your ability to get care is good in urban areas, in rural areas, um, where your ability to access well-trained nurses and doctors uh, is, is, is uniform across this country. But it also it means a country where we focus on prevention as well, where we uh, you know, support efforts to make neighborhoods safe, where housing uh, is available uh, to everyone and it's not and we don't have the profound homelessness crisis we have, which is, uh, as you know, your lieutenant governor, uh, Dr. Green knows, uh, you know, homelessness is a health issue and is a health crisis. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, have really admired uh, some of the work that ha Hawaii has been uh, developing, you know, to address homelessness. So the more we dig in to issues around equity, uh, what, we, what we find is that the ingredients to good health, to equitable health, are rooted not just in our hospitals and our clinics, but in the structure of society, in our schools, uh, and how and you know how how well uh, you know they do and how well they support our kids. They're rooted in our workplaces. They're rooted in access to strong local public health. And COVID has exposed that too. That many of our local departments of public health, which we rely on during times of outbreaks, but also in between, that they have been struggling for decades with improper funding and insufficient funding with uh, a lack of resources to support personnel as well as technology infrastructure. This is our time, as, as profoundly difficult as it is, this is our time to look at those deeper challenges, to fill those holes, to close those gaps, uh, and to ultimately ensure that when we come out of this pandemic, we're not just getting rid of COVID or suppressing COVID or managing it, but we're building a healthcare and public health system uh, that is much more strong, uh, strong than what we had before, and that really serves ultimately our values, which is to ensure that everyone, every man, woman, every child in our country has access um, to the kind of healthy, uh, fulfilling life that they all deserve. So you've spoken uh, just now about what needs to happen in terms of the distribution of the vaccine. However, I, I wanted to ask if you had any um, advice in terms of how we can um, individually reassure the public that the vaccines are in fact the safest, most effective way to counter the pandemic and keep our loved ones safe. And, and um, you know, what is the language that each of us um, listening to you now can use um, with the, the uh, immediate community around us? 
Well, Maya, this is a really timely question because the, this, the feedback you just shared is being echoed in many parts of the country, whereas people are trying to deliver the vaccine and administer it in healthcare systems around the country to nursing home residents and staff, they're finding a surprising uh, level of hesitancy. And that comes from different places, you know, I would say. And it's important to sort of recognize that because it affects how we address it. Uh, but for some people, they're hesitant to take the vaccine because they don't want to be the first one. Uh, there are many, uh, for example, nursing homes we heard from where people are saying, you know, I, I won't be, I don't want to get in the first round, but let me get in the second round. Uh, I want to see how people do. Uh, another reason for hesitancy has been that there has been a lot of misinformation over the last year that COVID is not dangerous, that it's just like the flu, that it's not really that big of a deal. Um, but third, I think there's also been a politicization of the, the process around responding to COVID and particularly around the vaccine itself. The process of actually developing the vaccine was really guided, in fact, by science. But a lot of the communications around the vaccine had a political overlay that I think made many people worried that maybe it was being pushed forward too quickly. Maybe it was not being scrutinized enough uh, in terms of its safety and its effectiveness. But the good news about this is that the process that the Food and Drug Administration took to evaluate these vaccines was actually quite robust. It wasn't uh, just, it wasn't political appointees who were signing off and saying, okay, this is safe to use. It was actually career scientists, many of whom I've worked with like over the years, um, who evaluated this. It was outside independent advisors on an advisory board called VERPAC, uh, which looked closely uh, at this data to opine on whether it was safe uh, and effective based on the current data that we have. These are the, uh, and I should also say that there are other academic scientists from around the country uh, who have also looked at this data and have not only said that this vaccine is, uh, you know, is it should receive emergency use authorization, but they themselves, you know, have stood in line, uh, those who are clinicians, to receive uh, that vaccine. But what matters, I think, when we're communicating with people is number one, that we acknowledge uh, their concerns and that we not uh, dismiss them uh, as uh, being somehow misguided or, or ignorant, uh, even though they may be based perhaps in some cases on misinformation. The second thing I think is it's it, what's really important is who people hear from. Uh, you know, hearing from people who understand your experience, who are from your community matters. There, many times I realized as Surgeon General that I wasn't the most effective messenger. The most effective messenger was somebody who was from the community that I was visiting. Uh, and you know who people recognize who they had years and years of trust with. And so the message matters, but the messenger sometimes matters even more. And if we want to overcome vaccine hesitancy, we need to build partnerships with uh, local leaders uh, on the ground who can help take that message forward, whether they're faith leaders, whether they're individual nurses and doctors who are speaking to their patients, um, whether they are other you know local leaders in the community. Uh, and lastly, my, I, I would say this, it's, it's important, I think, as we communicate with people to say that, um, that these vaccines, uh, again, that, that while they are being developed more quickly than vaccines have been in the past, it's not because corners are being cut. It's because we are benefiting from technology that has been in development for years and years and years. That's allowed us to actually accelerate the development of these vaccines, but still do so with care uh, and with scrutiny so that it is uh, just still as safe and as effective as our process was before. In the same way that you know we have computers now that are a lot smaller than they were 20 years ago, that are a lot faster than they were 20 years ago. We're the beneficiaries really of decades of science that has evolved to allow us to create these vaccines quickly. And the single uh, best pathway for our country to get through this pandemic at this point is to ensure that we're vaccinating um, as many people as possible. So as, as the 19th Surgeon General, you emphasize that um, medicine is all about relationships, ultimately. You listened uh, and met with uh, people in every state uh, over the course of many months, and you came to understand the power of social connection and community, uh, of, of empathy after tragedy and of, of joyful belonging. Uh, to the healing bodies and minds, the importance and connection of, of, um, of community and, and personal peace um, to the development of public health. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, about that journey and um, what perhaps surprised you the most about the human 
experience during that listening tour? Gosh, Maya, well, first of all, you have a good memory because I know we talked about that listening tour uh, several years ago and, um, and it was really impactful for me. Um, it was actually very interesting. I'll just share the background a bit on that experience. Uh, you know, when I started as, as Surgeon General, I didn't intend uh, to go on a listening tour when I was first nominated. But what happened to me is I actually had a very difficult confirmation process, a uh, Senate confirmation process, because my confirmation ended up getting mired and caught up uh, in politics, unfortunately. And so it took nearly 13 months uh, for them to work through uh, a long, long process until I was finally confirmed. And I had a lot of time to think uh, during those 13 months. And I came out of that just feeling like I, rather than talking, I, I just wanted to, to listen. I wanted to kind of reset my foundation here. And that is what we had been taught in medical school. You know, you know I remember as a third year uh, medical student going into the hospital and my preceptor telling me that the single most important mistake that doctors make is they cut patients off and they try to diagnose before they listen. And so I thought, well, maybe this is one of those moments where if I'm feeling confused and unsure about you know, who to believe and what data to follow, I should just actually go out and listen. And so that's what we did. And that's what we started the listening tour. And it remains to this day, one of the most educational informative experiences uh, that I underwent. And so what, what happened to me is when I visited communities, big and small, all across the country, I would go in with just a simple question and ask people, well, you know, how could I help? And I would try to listen to what they said. Some of the things they told me were, would not be surprising to you. You know, people talked about their struggles with substance use disorders. They talked about uh, the difficulty their kids were having with depression and anxiety. They spoke with great concern about how to handle social media, how much time to let their kids have on before screens. And they worried about the rise in obesity and heart disease that they were seeing around them. But the thing that surprised me, my, my answer to your question, was that behind so many of these stories, there was this deeper emotional pain uh, that I would sense. And in the beginning, I didn't quite know uh, how to address it or what to do about it, but it was a familiar theme. And so I started asking people uh, more about whether they felt fulfilled and happy in their lives about what was actually bothering them. And what I came to see it was that at the root of so many of their stories were these deeper threads of isolation and of loneliness where people felt like they had to really deal with all the challenges in their life by themselves. And they wouldn't come up to me and say, you know, hi, my name is Maya, my name is Vivek, I'm lonely. But they would say things like this. They would say, you know, I feel like I have to deal with all of these struggles by myself, or I feel invisible, or if I disappear tomorrow, nobody would even care. And hearing that, not just from people who are in the twilight of their lives and living alone, but also hearing this from college students who were on college campuses with thousands of other students, hearing it from moms and dads who were working in jobs where they saw people in the workplace and in their neighborhoods, but still felt alone, hearing it from CEOs and from members of Congress even who behind closed doors uh, would confide in me that they too were struggling with loneliness. It helped me realize that there was something far deeper that was happening in our society. Something that I had interestingly seen uh, in my own life as, as a child who struggled uh, with loneliness for many, many years. Uh, in fact, my, my, like the hardest times in the day were in the morning as a child when my mother would drop me off at school and I'd feel the sinking pit in my stomach because I wasn't scared about teachers and exams. I was actually scared about walking into the cafeteria and having no one to sit next to. Uh, I was, I felt profoundly lonely and that resurfaced many times during adulthood. And I was also reminded during this time as Surgeon General, seeing so much loneliness about my experience as a doctor, uh, you know, who never really learned about loneliness and isolation in medical school, but who every day in the hospital saw patients who would come in with serious illness uh, and have to deal with really difficult decisions about whether to go down a treatment path or go for surgery or not, but they would have to do that all on their own because there was nobody uh, that they had to confide in. So that remains one of the most profound uh, for me realizations. Um, and it was a point of education that I was blessed to receive from the people that I met all across the country. Thank you. That's very powerful and an important lesson for us all to consider at this time. Let's talk a little bit more about loneliness later, but first I just want to um, ask you, after you know, co-chairing um, President-elect Biden's COVID task force, 
as I understand that you're slated to return to your post as Surgeon General. And I, I wanna ask you, what um, can you do this time that you didn't do the first time? What are you excited about? Uh, you know, how has the job description changed for you and, and how perhaps have you changed since your last um, uh, stint as Surgeon General? It's a good question. I actually, this is something I find myself thinking about a lot and trying to reflect on before I, I sort of dive right back in uh, to government, even though it feels like I'm in government already because there's so much we're still doing on COVID at the moment. But, you know, I think there are some things, I think there, things are different sort of in three areas. I think one is obviously the world is different. We're in the midst of a profound pandemic. Um, I think the second thing that's different, though, is that the nature of the job that I'm being asked to to assume is, is somewhat different uh, in the sense that, you know, the president-elect, you know, asked me, has asked me to, to really focus on uh, helping shape uh, the COVID response in partnership with Jeff Zients, our COVID coordinator and our incoming CDC director and, and a few others. Uh, so there's a, there's a larger role to play here in shaping the, the response to the pandemic. And there's an additional role that he has asked me to, uh, to play in, in helping to shape our approach to deeper, more, uh, you know, more profound health challenges that need an all of government response. So think about substance use disorders. Think about the mental health crisis that we face. Think about the need for us to actually address social determinants of health, uh, the roots of health that often lie in our transportation system and our education system and housing uh, and food access. Uh, and then also think about issues like racial equity and health and the exacerbation of those disparities that we've seen to address these challenges, even though they're connected to health, it requires a lot more than just the Department of Health and Human Services being active. It requires really taking an all of government approach where we ask, how can we stitch together the levers at the Department of Education and Labor, at the Departments of Housing and Urban Development? How can we use assets from HHS, from Health and Human Services as well, and put all of these together to create the most comprehensive response effort possible? I mean, just take mental health, for example. We know so many of our children struggle uh, with depression and anxiety, yet it often takes years and years before, after symptoms develop uh, for children to be diagnosed. And so they don't receive often the help that they need. If we really want to strengthen our, our mental health in our country, so we need not only uh, to have a better care system that's reimbursed adequately, that's integrated into primary care, that's, uh, that's supported. But we also need to make sure our schools are places where kids can get help, where parents actually know enough about mental health concerns to be able to identify when something may be uh, awry and then have access uh, to help uh, so that they can get the support that their children need. Um, so that's another area that the uh, president-elect has asked me to, to help on. And, and I've been, I'm grateful for that because, you know, it's, it's, much easier to tackle some of these problems if we recognize at a presidential level that they require all levers of government uh, to be involved in fashioning a solution. And finally, I'll just say, how, how have I changed and what do I want to do differently? I think I'm, in, I'm, you know, all of us change, you know, we're all constantly evolving. I'm, I'm no different. I, I hope that I'm evolving for the better, although sometimes uh, my wife reminds me that that's not guaranteed. <laughs> so, uh, but I think there are things I've learned uh, from my past experience. And you know, I think I've learned, for example, that um, how to better utilize, for example, like levers in government and, and how to better navigate the complexities of bureaucracy to ultimately drive toward uh, clear goals. I think I came away with a deeper appreciation for uh, actually prioritizing my engagement with the community. Uh, which I hope to do even more this time around, because you can very easily in DC get stuck in the building, as we used to say, uh, meaning you can sit there all day, be plenty occupied with work and meetings and this and that, and never get out uh, to see people uh, where they are and understand what they're going through. Um, but on a really personal level, Maya, I think one of the, I want to correct a mistake that I made uh, the first time around uh, on a personal level. I, I made the mistake of... Um, saying that um, this job is is so important that I the way to succeed in it is to put all of my time and energy into it, even at the expense of my family and staying in touch with friends. And I realized I was, in retrospect, that was the wrong decision to make. And I didn't make it consciously. It's not like I sat down one day and, and wrote this down on a piece of paper and said, I'm going to sacrifice time with family and friends. It didn't happen like that. 
but it rarely ever does, right? In our life, it happens insidiously, right? We we start taking an additional meeting during dinner time, or we take that call that comes when we're playing with our children, or our kid we're putting our you know our child to bed, and then we remember, oh wait, let me have to check a message, and then we uh, leave them on the bed and we're scrolling through our phone. Uh, these are the subtle but um, insidious ways in the, through which work can uh, can invade our time with people. And, uh, and it's not to say that you, you, know, you don't have to work really hard in these roles, but what I wanna do better this time around is I wanna make the time that I have with my family and friends really count by being fully present. Uh, and I wanna make sure I protect uh, some of that time with them. Uh, and it's not just for them, it's actually really for me too, because I've learned over the years that one of the most powerful sources of fuel that we have are the love and compassion and care we receive and that we give through our relationships with one another. And when we don't have those relationships or when they're weaker and attenuated because of a lack of attention and presence, then our fuel runs dry and we actually can't be as effective at work and in the world as we want to be. And that was a great irony is that I sacrificed time with family and friends in order to serve work. But in the end, I ended up not being able to work nearly as effectively as I could have if I had the fuel of my family and friends. So I wanna make sure that those priorities are clear this time around. And the stakes are even higher because I now have two uh, beautiful children, uh, my son Tejas, who's uh, four and a half and a daughter Shanti, who's almost three. And uh, as somebody told me before I had children, they said, your kids won't, will sometimes listen to what you say, but they'll more often listen to what you do so make sure that you serve as a good role model for them. And I want my children to, to grow up prioritizing people, putting people first. And that means that I've got to live that life too. Absolutely, that's central to your work, your, your mission and, and your importance as a leader. And thank you for giving that reminder to all of us, something that all of us as parents and friends and family members um, perhaps should should hear, especially now at a time when uh, work is taking place at all times, um, often from a distance and uh, where there is no clear uh, line um, when work ends and it's time to go home. So thank you for that important reminder. You mentioned school and the importance of education as part of your vision and, and uh, plans for the future. Uh, I think that at this point, I'd therefore like to acknowledge our Hawaii Teacher of the Year, Lori Kui, who is on the call today, and her third grade students who helped us to shape questions for you um, about loneliness and connection. Uh, Ms. Kui, the third graders would like to ask you um, about um, whether or not, um, you know, how do we stop cyberbullying at a time when we are spending so much more time online? And, you know, how, what is your advice on how we can both individually uh, foster healthy relationships and connections and what we can do in community? Hmm. Well, wonderful questions. And to have them come from children, I think uh, it means a lot. I think children are instinctually very wise uh, about human connection and the need for it. I think they seek it out at the earliest stages of life, but then things happen to them along the way. They take on messages from society where we tell them uh, that they need to look out for themselves. And if they don't do that, then uh, no one else is gonna look out for them. Or they have sometimes traumatic experiences which make them feel perhaps that they can't trust others. Or I think most insidiously, they lose faith in themselves and their sense of self and their sense that their esteem erodes because of challenges or sometimes because of lack of support. And, uh, and ultimately once that happens, it can be even harder to connect with others. There are a couple of things I think that uh, I would offer that I, I hope can be helpful. You know, one is even though we're quite separate during this pandemic, it turns out that small amounts of time that we may spend with one another when done in a regular uh, basis can actually have a, a profound impact on how connected we feel. So if we are able, for example, to just make 15 minutes each day to spend with people we care about, that could be simply uh, having a conversation, you know, with your sibling or with your parents 
uh, or with a child. It could be calling up uh, a friend on the phone or video conferencing with them just to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. Uh, I wanted to see how you are. It could be writing an email to an old friend um, just to check in and see how they're doing. Uh, but those 15 minutes can make a profound impact uh, when done regularly over time. The second thing that can be powerful is to make that time really count. And the way you do that is by eliminating distraction uh, when you're engaging in conversation with others. It turns out that one of the greatest gifts that we can give one another is the gift of our full attention. But partly because we have been blessed with technology, we've also unfortunately experienced the curse of technology, which is that it can intrude in our conversations and distract us. You know, I, I'm you know, no, no different than anyone else in the sense that I've experienced many times uh, how distracting tech can be. And I've found myself sometimes during conversation uh, with somebody just reaching into my pocket and pulling out my phone and checking my email. And I have no reason to really check my email, but it's just, it be, you know, become a habit. And so I, I do. And then before you know it, you're in a message and you think you can listen on the phone and check your email and Google the scores from the game last night. And, uh, and the truth is science tells us very clearly we can't do that, that when we're actually multitasking, we are giving neither task our full attention. And the truth is many people often realize that. Um, but it turns out when you, if you've had the experience of being fully immersed in conversation with somebody, giving them your full attention, being truly open with them and listening deeply to what they're saying, then you know that five minutes of fully present conversation can often be more powerful than 30 minutes of distracted conversation. So that's the second thing I'd keep in mind. And the last couple of uh, you know, things to mention is that it, number three, it turns out that serving others, that service can be one of the most powerful antidotes to loneliness and separation. Uh, and this has to do with how loneliness actually affects our body. It turns out for evolutionary reasons uh, that when you're lonely, that your attention actually turns inward uh, to yourself that you're, you become more, um, more suspicious, if you will, more of others around you, more hypervigilant. Uh, and you also experience an erosion of self-esteem over time as, you're, uh, as you come to believe that perhaps you're lonely because you're not wanted or because you're not lovable or because you're uh, you know, not likable. And what's powerful about service is it, it flips those, those patterns on, on their head, it short circuits uh, those really deleterious patterns. And it does so by shifting the attention from you to somebody else, the person you're serving. And it also reminds you those acts of service that you do have value uh, to bring to the world. And in this moment, there are many ways to serve one another, uh, simply dropping food off to a friend who might be struggling or a neighbor who may be scared to go to the grocery store because they're worried about the pandemic. That is an act of service. Calling a friend to check on them because you know they've been having a hard time. That's an act of service. Offering to just even virtually babysit uh, for 10 minutes for a friend who you know is struggling uh, with homeschooling their children while also uh, you know, working from home. That is an act of service. So if we look carefully, we'll find there are many ways to serve. Uh, for kids in particular, but really truly for all of us, I think it's worth remembering one last thing which is that our ability to connect with other people is built on a foundation of connection to ourselves. And what does it mean to be connected to yourself? Well, it means to be comfortable with yourself, to know your value, to understand your worth. And the truth is there are many of us who walk around today uncertain of whether we have value, of whether we matter. And there are messages all around us that tell us, in fact, that we don't. They're usually paired with a product or service that's trying to be sold to us. But the bottom line is that message is, is coming through to our children all the time that they're not thin enough, they're not good looking enough, they're not smart enough, they're not rich enough, they're not popular enough. And what's powerful about, uh, about building connection to self is that yes, it can come from our relationships. Sometimes great relationships can reaffirm to us who we are, serving as mirrors uh, that we often desperately need. But moments of solitude as well can be very, very helpful in building that connection to self. As, as Maya was saying earlier, there's a difference between solitude and loneliness. Solitude is a welcome state of aloneness. Loneliness is a state of aloneness that brings pain uh, and despair. But we have become less comfortable with being alone, with solitude. And one of the challenges we face today is how to recapture some of that comfort, how to find just five minutes a day 
for example, where we can sit on our porch and feel the breeze against our face, when we can enjoy uh, a few minutes of meditation or prayer or just being in nature, those few minutes, as simple as they are, are when we gather ourselves, when we reground ourselves. Those are the moments where we reflect when we simply be. And when we approach our relationships with other people, our conversations with one another, from a place of being more grounded, more connected to ourselves, then we're more able to be present with other people. We're more able to show up as who we are authentically, as opposed to trying to be who we think they want us to be. So even though we're in the midst of this very difficult pandemic that's preventing us from going out and seeing each other, these simple tools of 15, 15 minutes a day, being present with one another, seeking opportunities to serve, and investing in these moments of solitude to deepen our connection to self, these can help us build a more connected life. And if we all do this together, that is how we ultimately build a more connected world. Thank you. That is a beautiful and lyrical way to end uh, our time together. I wish we had more of it. Um, but thank you for all of the community solutions that you feature in your book and in your work. Um, there are um, some questions that uh, we did not get to, of course, some in the Q&A and others um, which we received beforehand. Um, but um, I hope that um, everyone present uh, was able to um, take away something of importance and value. Um, I certainly have, and I thank you for creating spaces um, where we can find that hope and connection and consider our mindset and cultural shifts and our daily practice and become curious about one another and find new tools to challenge social isolation. So thank you. Uh, oh, and I, can I just actually share one last thought because you just reminded me of it in your, your closing. I just want to put this in context also that you know we're facing a lot of challenges in the world, but there's a reason I think why you and I are talking about loneliness and connection tonight. And it's, it's because at the foundation of our lives, at the, at the heart of our ability as a society to take on difficult challenges, whether it's climate change or this pandemic uh, or inequalities in, in health, at the heart of that is really our ability to come together, to connect deeply with each other. And if you look at what's happening around the country and truly around the world, people have been becoming more separate from one another, more fragmented. Uh, you know, we can live really on our own. We can order everything we need from Amazon. We can get mail, you know, to our doorstep. We can order groceries. Like we can get everything we need without having to interact with people more and more and more and entertain ourselves, uh, you know, uh, via Netflix, on the internet, uh, you know, endlessly. But the challenge of this fracturing of our relationships with one another is that we're not able to pull together during times of hardship. And so if you look at the world and you worry about the polarization that we're seeing, if you worry about whether we can really uh, address some of these profound intractable uh, challenges that are before us, I would just remind you of what people all around our country taught me when I was Surgeon General last time around, which is that our strength, our strength comes from our connection with one another that our relationships are our greatest source of resilience, that they are buffers to stress. And that when we do things together, it's extraordinary how much hardship we can endure. But when we do things alone, uh, often we can't do nearly as much. And there's this old African proverb that I, I included in the book because it struck me and is, is being so true for today. Uh, a proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And that's the great challenge that we have today, but perhaps one of the greatest challenges is how do we build a truly people-centered life? How do we build a community where people are more deeply connected to one another? And that starts with the choices we make each and every day about investing in people. Uh, it starts with how we design our schools and workplaces to support human connection with the topics we choose to bring up in the public square and what we make a priority in our policy making. But if you had to sum all of this up into a simple credo, I think it would just be three words. It would be put people first. That is the greatest lesson that I took from my experiences as Surgeon General and in my explorations of loneliness and social connection afterward, 
is that what we're called to do right now, if we want to really build a people-centered society, is to ask how in the decisions we make, about how we lead our lives, about how we uh, support organizations, about how we decide who to vote for at the ballot box, that we ask that question, how do we put people first? And if we follow that path, I believe it will lead us to greater connection, to better health, and ultimately to greater fulfillment. So, thank you, Maya. Thank you so very much um, for those words and reminders. Really valuable. Appreciate it. Um, and now uh, we will hear from two important voices at the center of the conversation about healthcare and wellness in Hawaii. Um, many regard Hawaii as a healthcare model, but some in our community are clearly suffering more than others from diabetes, mental health challenges, physician shortages, and a lack of health insurance. And uh, Kealoha Fox and, and Lieutenant Governor Josh Green have both worked very hard to bring together policymakers, leaders, um, physicians, public servants, and others to identify these divides and gaps in care um, to research interventions thoughtfully and to implement solutions. So first, I would like to welcome Kelohan Fox. You've worked as a, um, a Native Hawaiian health advocate for many years, and I'd love um, to start by putting this pandemic into the context of Hawaiian history a bit. If you could speak briefly about the ways that contagion and colonialism have been entwined here in Hawaii? Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. So the, the context of the coronavirus is really important for us to understand because now it's added to a history of Hawaii that joins a successive list of outbreaks, epidemics, and previous pandemics due to contagious diseases since Western contact. And, and this isn't just um, the history of Kanaka Maoli and Native Hawaiians here in Hawaii. This is really, um, unfortunately, a trauma embedded in the history of indigenous peoples around the world, where population collapse, land degradation, political turmoil, and cultural loss has these really compounded impacts that are not only about the virus itself, but are about so much more of the way that we live and the ways that we express our health, either positively or negatively. So in my time as a student at the University of Hawaii, I was able to really deeply study that history and gain experience as a biomedical scientist at JABSUM. So understanding those clinical pathways was something that I deeply immersed myself in as a Native Hawaiian woman scientist. But what I really wanted to do is go further. And I'm so lucky that the University of Hawaii and Jabsum supported me in this endeavor where um, my research was really um, embedded in understanding the Hawaiian conceptualization of illness and sickness and disease, but at the same time, understanding the nosology of what those diseases are and the taxonomy, right, of how to heal. As part of that process of uh, indigenizing um, healthcare, um, can you, um, you know, share with us um, the special health prevention, health promotion, health services um, that um, that you believe that we should uh, take? Uh, you know, what is most important um, in in that process? Absolutely. And, you know, when we, we first started talking about this webinar, this is something that really stirred me and it really brought me back to being trained as a young healthcare professional. I was honored to actually first meet Dr. Murthy in D.C. when he was appointed by President Obama to the um, Presidential Advisory Council on, on Prevention and Health promotion in public health. And, you know, in, in my in my training at that time, we're here a decade later and um, I continue to be really enlightened in the work that we're doing of how do we agendize health prevention instead of just focusing on chronic conditions and acute care? How do we have strategy sessions around you know, critical integration of cultural and linguistic standards and best practices into public health? And then how do we resource health promotion programs and projects and activities that are led by community leaders who know best how to deploy those programs? And so, you know, I think about the work of Dr. Murthy and Dr. Green and, and, and you, Auntie Maya, and I'm just really, um, really thankful that we're able to, to be here together and to celebrate and promote the ways that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders um, are doing this work today. And I think um, that's really important for us to start 2021 on such a positive note for us to reflect on our diversity, our values, and the, the pulse of the community being really paramount so that we can have representation in decision-making, representation across race and ethnicity, 
gender, geographics, and, and social position that make up this really complex tapestry of, of really making solid plans resourcing those plans, acting, and then constantly having um, this cycle. Um, in our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander COVID response team, we um, we always talk about um, coming together, pupukahi holomua. This is our time to come together and tackle this given task. And, and I think that's always at the core of what we're doing. We're not trying to do it as an individual. No one has that special lightsaber. No one has the playbook anymore that we're actually doing it together. We're doing it as a community. And we're doing it based off of these collectivistic cultural values that our, our kupuna, our ancestors, have handed down for us across millennia. You um, have done a lot of work with women as well and advocacy uh, for women's health. Uh, you uh, have noted that women suffer more from um, the impacts of health crisis. And uh, that has certainly been the case here in terms of uh, domestic violence, for instance. Um, as an advocate um, for women, you've seen both the vulnerability and resilience of, of, of women in Hawaii. And I love your strength-based approach so often, but can you just uh, give us a, a couple of minutes on how we can best serve the goals of women's health at this time? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, so part of my research has really been um, focused in this uh, specific, you know, area that we really have a tremendous focus on. And as a as a as a woman and a mother and a daughter, I'm in caregiver myself. This is something that I think about not just professionally in a managed care, um, you know, professional sense, but also within my own family. Um, I think it's really important for us right now to keep a pulse on um, obviously uh, the rights of reproductive justice. We really want to make sure that there are high quality maternal and infant health care throughout the pandemic and going into recovery. And speaking of recovery, I think it's really important for us to take um, the important uh, lessons and uh, research and best practices of, of knowing what the social determinants of health are and ensuring that we're not just talking about the physical health of women, but that we're also talking talking about economic sufficiency, about safe and stable housing, around um, educational opportunities, all of these different pathways that make up how a whole person and a whole family and how whole communities um, can thrive. And I, I know that we're, we're uh, I'm gonna transition to my friend here, um, the Lieutenant Governor. Um, and I just wanted to end with just one ole lono eao that um, reminds me of all of the courageous women and leaders in our community right now, um, including all of us um, on this uh, illustrious panel today. And it's ho'olau kanaka i kaleo na manu, that these voices of the birds, they, they place a feeling of, of belonging. And that when you listen to the voices of those birds, that you know that you're connected to something bigger than yourself and that life is bound by these mini birds singing together. So just, um, I thank you and mahalo you all for allowing me to sing with you today um, in the great work that we have ahead. And I'm, I'm happy to um, tackle the good cause and, and listen to um, Dr. Green next on how we can do that more specifically for Hawaii and all of our islands. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo for that olelo no eao and for your tireless work and aloha. And yes, let's now hear from our Lieutenant Governor Green, who has been at the center of our um, year-long struggle to manage this pandemic here in Hawaii and to preserve the health of our beloved community. Um, thank you, Dr. Green, for being here. Don't call me Josh, it upsets me. <laughs> and thank you for your leadership. And I know you've got a lot going on, so we really are grateful that you are staying with us. Um, uh, early in the pandemic, you were an outspoken critic of the Department of Health's um, slow ramp up of testing and contact tracing. And I just want to ask you, has it all been fixed? Um, how are we doing? And uh, what sort of public health infrastructure uh, do we need uh, to develop for the next crisis? Thank you, Maya. I, in, the, in a world this crazy, nothing is being fixed, as you know, but it's being improved each day and week and month. And the Department of Health really did rally extraordinarily over the course of uh, the summer and fall and and pivoted in a way that is hard to pivot during a huge crisis. It's not a guarantee that you can do it. And they really did do special things to get contact tracing and testing and, and the imminent ramp up for vaccinations all going with sometimes limited resources. And we only have so many people here in the islands, as you know, that get to work on problems or challenges. So 
it has been extraordinary and I'm very proud of them. And, and I hope I wasn't overly hypercritical. I, I worried about that. I still worry about that. Uh, but we were facing kind of an existential crisis in my opinion, as I watched COVID begin to surge toward us. So uh, sometimes you just have to take action, uh, but I am so proud of everyone who's been working on this challenge. Thank you. And, and you've really stayed positive and very focused um, during this pandemic. And um, I, I wanted to ask, has your own experience with COVID changed your perspective? And uh, what do you think we need to do um, now to build um, trust here in Hawaii um, around not only the vaccine, but um, uh, the work of leadership moving forward? The COVID uh, crisis has changed me profoundly. My goodness. So the isolation is, is a profound uh, changer of society. And I feel strongly that it has created, in many ways, post-traumatic stress disorder for mankind. I can't believe I haven't seen you in a year. And I'm not trying to be, you know, to be clever. I, it's just shocking to me that someone who I like so much, I wouldn't see for a year. Or uh, same thing goes for my father, who I haven't seen for a year, who has gone from age 70 five to 76. I last saw him on his 75th birthday because we celebrated together. Uh, but the isolation has changed so many things. And in order to restore trust, it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, a couple other reflections. Uh, what we're seeing today, I have it even here in the room. I can't uh, feel guilty now. I feel TV and multitask guilt by Vivek because I got the CNN as they discuss the next president. And um, I to see what we saw today and and you know, the pain that's in society, it's going to take a lot of work to restore trust and belief so that when we do something like a vaccination program, we can get everyone to believe that it will be okay, that it will be uh, something that was scientific and it was worth uh, pursuing and, and can be a part of our survival, our resurrection. You know, that is important. And then let me just say how close to home all of this has been for me. So it's not an abstraction. Um, we know what the isolation has done to us as a society. And, and just so everyone realizes that it's not down the road or down in another um, county or another state, I think you guys are aware of the trauma that occurred here in downtown about a month ago. Um, a woman was tragically assaulted and um, it was sex assault and it was um, violence and she almost died and she was found bleeding by the elevator and we have been speaking abstractly about how many people are isolated and how these things happen well that incident happened in the apartment next to mine not down the hall not a floor down not in a different building it was my next door neighbor that did that to that woman and my children maya <laughs> named probably after you somehow spiritually who is 13 and my 10 year old experience the aftermath of that tragic incident as they walked down the hall and saw the blood from the isolation that occurred where this person cracked and did something terrible. And it was next door to us, to your Lieutenant governor and to a physician and to a person that we all work with in me. And so it has just come home so profoundly to me how interconnected both the work has to be and the tragedy can be. Um, and this, you know, this effort that we have to undertake. I couldn't believe that that would happen. It was almost like being in a, in a movie. And that's the way a lot of this crisis has gone. We watch it like a movie and then we realize it's really right here for us. So we can restore trust. We can have hope as we get better as a people. We have extraordinary people coming together now, like um, Dr. Murphy coming back to us in the government. So I'm optimistic. That's why I stay optimistic because I've watched it and I know that there are, can be terrible moments and there can be extraordinary moments and the extraordinary moments lie ahead. So why not be positive? Thank you. I'm really sad to hear that um, that, that happened um, and, and that, you know, your, your children, um, you know, were, were impacted and, and that that woman um, uh, suffered. Um, let's, who's, I guess, with, a, um, a look to the future, um, you know, 
Dr. Murthy talked about his vision for a more socially connected society. And his Hawaii, I hope, is better off than some in that respect. Um, we have um, an expanded sense of ohana. We have an ethic of aloha. We have um, a higher percentage of intergenerational households. And we have people um, who, as I mentioned, you know, bridge worlds and are woven together um, in, in, in culture and community. Um, can you leave us, though, with um, a few thoughts on what more we can do uh, and perhaps what government can do, but, but also what um, our communities and individuals in them can do to foster not just a healthier society, but a truly happier one in the years ahead? I, I, I surely can. I, you know, I think that Hawaii is, we've, we've always said, is one of the extraordinary places if not the most extraordinary places in our um, in our country. And here we are, of course, also between worlds. We know that, we're aware of that between, uh, you know, the United States and uh, Asia, which is so rich in culture. I think that we can reflect that we've done better because there have been extraordinary efforts from friends like General Hara and our director of health and people making decisions that, have kept, even though we've had this crisis, have kept the tragedy lower, less. And that is something that I know people have noticed. And as we strip back COVID and we see the challenges that, that you and Dr. Murthy and Dr. Fox have been talking about this last hour, we know that we will again remember that homelessness is there and we'll, that Hawaii is here and that the multicultural um, people we have are here. And we've gone through this challenge. I I'm going to say something t slightly political. We've gone through the challenge of the pr this last four years of the federal administration, which hurt me deeply when I thought about what it meant to people. And as I think about surviving that and surviving the COVID crisis, I think that we should know we have incredible futures ahead. And here we are, we're still together. And so I think after this crisis, other crises will seem small in many ways, or they will seem so, like something we can actually take on. And uh, to go back to it and close with what Dr. Murthy said, the satisfaction and the value that you get from giving and, and serving is extraordinary. And people will be able to understand that better when we come out of COVID alive. And when we are re-engaged with one another, we can actually hug each other again and embrace. So. I'm completely optimistic about the future. It did take a couple surreal challenges for all of us, uh, but I see, I definitely see the light at the end of this tunnel now and I'm grateful for it. So I'm grateful for you and uh, Perk and all the people that come together for these kind of conversations, but I have, I have extremely high hopes for Hawaii for the future. I, I don't have any pessimism whatsoever. So I, I can't wait for the future. Thank you. We're Grateful for you too, and, and uh, grateful for all of you uh, on this call um, who are doing your part um, to, to build that beloved community and, and to do it um, together uh, with us. Um, there is much to be done, obviously, and the challenges are great, but um, I know that with the vision and innovation and courage um, displayed, um, by our panelists, but also you listening in that we will make it to the other side of this crisis and beyond um, in better health. Um, also must mahalo our sponsors uh, who made this possible, um, Robert Perkinson and the Better Tomorrow series, which is a joint venture of UH, um, Hawaii Community Foundation and Kamehameha Schools. Uh, mahalo to our uh, event sponsors, Hawaii Pacific Health, the Queens Health System, the John A. Burns School of Medicine, UH's College of Social Sciences, the William S. Richardson School of Law, and the UH's Office of Public Health Studies. Mahalo again to the incredible artist, Parinani Orm, for crafting and donating the life for Dr. Murthy. And um, to all of you, um, we send much um, aloha and high hopes. Please connect with each other, support each other, reach out to one another, uh, and keep uh, one another safe.